Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our second presentation tonight, cover the rest of the churches here in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we're grateful for all we've been able to learn so far. And this is the way that you're blessing us with understanding as we make our way through this very important book. Now we pray you help us be alert and attentive, and your spirit will speak to us here in a very direct and powerful, compelling way as we surrender the time now to you. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we found that the seven churches of Revelation deal with seven literal Christian churches, right? They were real places, real churches during the first century, and they're listed in geographical sequence. If you started out on a journey to visit these seven churches, you would visit them in the order that they are listed in Revelation. How many hours would it take to visit them all? Three. What did he say? No, he just went one through the others, about three and a half. Oh, for <laughs> They can add it all up then, right? <laughs> uh, the seven churches, now, Gusto was referring to the fact that the seven churches were not only literal churches in the first century, but they were symbolic of the Christian church in seven different historical eras, starting, as we learned, in John's time, and then spanning the, uh, the history of Christianity in the world all the way down to the return of Jesus Christ. And every right interpretation of prophecy always ends at that place, with the return of Jesus. Now we found that Ephesus, first church there, lost its first love, right? And then Smyrna, that was the persecuted church, heavily persecuted in, in Smyrna. Pergamus was afflicted with idolatry, afflicted with the sin of immorality. That came into the Pergamus church and that period. Now, here we have on the map, Ephesus, and then making our way up the coast there, Second Church, Smyrna, and then came uh, Pergamus. Now, we're going to turn to the last four churches in the second segment tonight, and we're going to start there with the Church of Thyatira. You can see that Ephesus represents the Apostolic Church from 31 AD to 100 AD by the time of all the apostles that had died by then. And then we have Smyrna, 100 to 313 A.D., a period of about 200 years when the persecution was so heavy against Christianity. Then came Pergamos, and uh, that was 313 to 538 A.D. Then we come to Thyatira, and that represents the church in the wilderness. For the longest time period, look at that, almost a thousand years, 538 A.D., all the way to 1500 AD. Now, what is it about Thyatira? Well, Thyatira was on a highway leading north out of Sardis on the way to Pergamos. So Thyatira was situated between two valleys, and it was famous for what were called matter roots, M-A-D-E-E-R, matter roots. And matter roots would yield a bright red, purplish color of dye. And with that red dye, that purple color, they would make robes for kings and queens, all right? So it was those matter roots that had their origin in Thyatira, and it was providing clothing for kings. Now, here's some of the ancient ruins from the ancient city of Thyatira. You can see that there's not much left there to see. All right, now, question one says, for what five things did Jesus commend this church of Thyatira. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, Jesus said, write this. These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. And he says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So they were commended for good works, love, Christian service, faith, and patience, which means perseverance, determination to persevere. So if Thyatira had a lot going for it as a church, and Christianity had a lot going for it in some aspects, in some seg segments of Christianity during this period that Thyatira represents. Question two says, at what time in their history were they most active 
in their good works. Well, we just read it. It said the last works were more, more prevalent, better than the first. Now, that's interesting because Thyatira was kind of just like the opposite of Ephesus, right? Remember, Ephesus started out well, but ended poorly, losing their love. Thyatira was actually better at the end of their period than they were at the beginning. Now, if Thyatira represents 538 to 1500 AD, we could ask, what happened in that five, uh, that almost thousand year period of time? What happened in Christianity during that thousand year span? Well, when we look at history, we find that pagan practices were incorporated into Christianity. What kind of practices? Pagan. pagan practices. Man, they came in wholesale at that time. The Roman church influenced the state to persecute those who were trying to be true to the biblical teachings of the Bible. And as the Roman church was moving upon the state to persecute Christians, Bible-believing, practicing Christians, these faithful saints had to flee... And the Bible says they fled into the what? Into the wilderness to escape the persecution that was coming upon them from this church-state union. People risk their lives, friends, to keep the truth of God's word alive and not let true worship vanish and disappear from the earth altogether. Now, on the screen here, we have a picture of some people called the Waldenses, or the Waldensians. You might have heard about them. The Huguenots in France, the Albigenses of southern France and northern Italy. These were people who had to go out into the mountain hideouts and refuges out in the wilderness just to stay alive and to keep the word of God and faith in God's word alive in their time. Now, near the end of the Thyatira period, the Protestant Reformation. Has anybody heard of this, the Protestant Reformation? You know what I'm talking about? Well, it was at the end of this Thyatira period that the Protestant Reformation started bringing renewal of the emphasis on biblical faith and biblical practice. Biblical faith and biblical practice. All right? We're talking about the Protestant Reformation coming at the end of the Thyatira period. Question three. What did God say had corrupted this church of Thyatira? Well, in spite of those five good things, he says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, what's her name? Jezebel. Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, you're allowing her to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, when it says you have that woman... Jezebel, that woman there, that phrase, that woman, could be translated from the Greek, it could be translated as your wife. Your wife. So, in a literal sense, the leader of the literal church in Thyatira in the first century had a wife, evidently, that was allowed to teach in the church, and she was teaching false doctrines. That was the problem. Not that she was teaching, but that she was teaching what? False doctrines. False doctrines. Now, in a spiritual sense, Christian leaders down to the century allowed the encroachment of false teachings and false doctrines to come in and to corrupt the Christian church. Let's read the note under number three. Are you on your lesson now? Let's look at number three. It says... Uh, the text says that Jezebel calls herself a prophetess, but she was not speaking for God. Jezebel was a heathen Phoenician princess who King Ahab of Israel had what? Uh, we had this marriage of a king of God's people, Israel, marrying a pagan princess. And then it says, as a priestess of Baal, Jezebel set herself to introduce, introduce what? Sun worship to Israel, and she succeeded. Almost the whole nation of Israel went into idolatry, and this marriage of Ahab and Jezebel and the subsequent apostasy of Israel was a type of the time when paganism would come into the church, and the head of the church became the head of the state. Sun worship, 
The foundation of pagan worship came in with all its trappings into the Christian church and is still perpetuated among certain groups. Wow. So the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, that was the deepest point of apostasy in national Israel in the Old Testament. And likewise, during something called the Dark Ages, that was the time of deepest apostasy in Christianity. Are you with me? So Israel had a time of deep apostasy with Ahab and Jezebel, and Christianity had a time of deep darkness in the Dark Ages as well. And the source of darkness was the same. In both Old Testament apostasy and New Testament apostasy, the source of both darknesses was unbiblical teachings and unbiblical practices. Gotta watch out for those things. Unbiblical teachings and practices lead to darkness. Question four. What were the sins that Jezebel brought into Israel that God felt were so heinous? What did Jezebel bring in? Well, it says... You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit two things. What are they? Sexual immorality, Sexual immorality and idolatry, right? And so the text specifically mentions seduction into rampant, widespread immorality, fornication, <coughs> and idolatry. Does that ring a bell? Rampant immorality and idolatry? Now, it says here in 1 Kings 21-25, there was no one like Ahab who sold himself, that he sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Uh-oh, because what? Jezebel. Jezebel, his wife, what did she do? She stirred him up. She stirred him up. So the text mentions the wanton, blatant practice of wickedness. It was being committed right in God's sight under the influence of... Jezebel. And so really the big problem is we had a weak man at the head of the nation. And what was his weakness? He wanted to please his wife more than he wanted to please God. Amen? That's what got him into trouble. Now, uh, it says in 1 Kings 21-26 about Ahab that he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done. So this text mentions Ahab's abominable behavior. He was mimicking, he was mimicking or copying what he was seeing the pagan Amorites do in these pagan nations around him. Does that sound familiar? Could Christians today be mimicking the world around them? It's interesting, isn't it? Whom the Lord, now talking about the Amorites, the Amorites, it says the Lord had cast them out before the children of Israel. Now, knowing that God had driven out the Amorites for their sinful practices, Ahab followed their example, hoping for a better outcome in his case than the Amorites had had. I guess they had thought that somehow God was a respecter of persons and that he would get away with the very things the Amorites faced the judgment of God over and were driven out. And it came to pass as though it had been a very trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. It says that Ahab took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and he served Baal, and he did what? Here we have the king of Israel, the leader of God's people. And what is he doing? He's worshiping Baal. Then he set up an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. This is getting worse, isn't it? <laughs> now they have building, actually building a temple in the capital city of Israel in Samaria. He builds a temple to Baal so he can set up an idol there and the people could worship him. Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more, look at this, he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. I tell you what, folks, that takes in a lot. That takes in a lot. Hey, is it easy to make God mad? Does God get angry quickly? No. No, it says in the Bible, he's slow 
to anger and of great kindness, merciful and gracious. And so you know that if Ahab succeeded in provoking the Lord to anger, he had to be a bad guy, right? He was really up to some stuff if he provoked God to anger more than anybody before him. They had managed to do it on a scale that was unrivaled by any of the other corrupt kings of Israel before him, and they were many before Ahab. Now the spirit of lawlessness, Husto was talking about the Nicolaitans, but the spirit of lawlessness and the free expression of natural impulses that you find in paganism had a demoralizing, corrupting effect upon the people and the nations. You know, the more sin is tolerated, what does it start to do? It's like a cancer and it starts to spread and grow. It becomes like a contagion and, and it takes over societies. It takes over nations. That's what was happening. You know the specific sins? Can you see it? Is it bright enough? Can you see what those sins are there? Idol worship, sun worship, obeying man-made traditions, eating meat offered to idols, immorality, fornication. Whew. These things were brought into Israel in the Old Testament, and they were brought into Christianity in the New Testament as well. So here's some dangers to be aware of tonight. Number one, it is easy to get caught up in sin while you're still formally worshiping God. You know, they still had the temple of God. It was there, and so they had the semblance of worshiping the God of Israel, but they were also committing sin, and it became easy to get caught up in that. And then we have number two, we need to be warned against the idea that you can acceptably worship God while you're committing sinful acts, and that can become acceptable over time, especially if the majority are doing it. When you start looking around and see everybody's doing it, it seems like it's acceptable, and you start getting caught up in it yourself. That's what was happening in ancient Israel and in Christianity in the modern era, or more modern era. Question 5 says, what will happen to those who are guilty of these crimes against God if they do not repent? Well, he says, indeed, I'm going to cast her into a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her into great what? Tribulation. Tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. Mm -hmm. Tribulation and even a sickbed. Oh, look at this. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches will know. I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give each one of you according to your work. So you can see here, friends, that the willful practice, what kind of practice? Willful. willful practice of known sin that invites God's corrective judgments. It's referred to in the Bible as the chastening of the Lord. You see, to bring sinners to repentance, God will sometimes use some severe means to bring that repentance about because we must be brought to understand the deadly nature of sin. God will use things like sickness. Yes or no? Yes. Says he would, right? He'll use pain. He'll use suffering. He'll use loss or fear to arrest our attention and lead us to turn from our sin and repent. Now, he doesn't say that everybody in Thyatira would be punished. Only those who needed the corrective discipline. And that was, of course, based on God's ability to read everybody's hearts and see who was really in need of judgment to bring repentance. Now, there was a guy named Azariah. And according to the Bible, he was Jezebel's son. Remember what it said about Jezebel's son there? Yeah, judgment was going to come on him, right? Well, Azariah was Jezebel's son, and guess what happened to him? He fell off a terrace. And after he fell off that terrace, the Old Testament says he laid on a bed of suffering for some time. And as he was laying on that bed of suffering for some time, he had time to, guess what? Repent and turn to God. But guess what Azariah did? Instead of repenting, he turned, it says, to Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. And then Azariah died. Because he didn't turn to the Lord and repent, he turned to the wrong source for healing. Question six. What comforting message did God give to those in Thyatira who had remained faithful to him? Now, to you I say, 
and the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, and who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other what? God said, I'm not going to burden those with problems and difficulties and judgments and all of that. Those that are being faithful to me, they'll bear no other burden. But he says, hold fast to what you have until I come. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, God says I'm going to give him power. Power over the nations. My friends, real power comes when we obey the word of God. Amen? When you're right with God, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you've got power. It says power over the nations. And you're going to rule them with a rod of iron. And they'll be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. And he says, I will give him the, what? I will give him the morning star. So those that were faithful in Thyatira period, they were going to get the morning star. Don't, don't forget that. At the end of the Thyatira period, as we start moving into that thing I call the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformers. Now, follow me closely. This is really, I think, very interesting that in the Old Testament, when when Ahab was leading Israel into apostasy and darkness and sin and morality because of his union with Jezebel, who did God send to turn Israel back to him? Who did God send? He sent a prophet. What was his name? Yeah, Elijah. Elijah the prophet came bursting onto the scene to confront the apostate leaders of Israel and reform Israel's rampant idolatry. Now, in the Protestant Reformation, was there anybody like Elijah? Bold, outspoken, speaking in truth to power, was there anybody like Elijah that burst on the scene in the beginning of the Protestant Reformation? What was his name? I hear somebody saying it. Martin Luther. Remember Martin Luther? Oh man, he was just like Elijah. And he confronted the apostasy that had swept into Christianity. And there was another guy that actually came before Martin Luther at the very beginning of the Reformation, and his name was John Wycliffe. And they called him the what? Morning. The morning star of the Reformation. What's the morning star? That's the, that's the first star you can see in the morning. Is that Venus that you can see up there? Uh, the first bright light we see? Yeah, that was like John Wycliffe. And then came Martin Luther. So God was bringing about the Reformation. Christ gives great incentives to be faithful and not compromise with sin. Even though others around us might be compromising If we do fall into sin, we have great incentives to repent and seek the Lord's forgiveness because it says the faithful will live and reign with Christ forever and ever and ever. All right, so there's Thyatira, 538 to 1500 at the latter part of that period there. We begin to see the Reformation coming about, and that leads us into the fifth church, which is Sardis. And Sardis actually means that which remains. So Sardis represents the Christian church during the Reformation period, which lasted from 1500 to approximately 1790. Did you get those dates there? Is it in your notes? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Now, Sardis was on the main highway, halfway between Thyatira and the next one we'll visit, Philadelphia. Sardis was on a high elevation, a thousand feet up, making it virtually impregnable to any attack. Sardis was on a high place, a thousand feet up. Um, Now, Sardis was actually conquered, though, by Cyrus the Great in 547 BC when a soldier scaled the wall and unlocked the gates from the inside while the people in Sardis were sleeping. And then in 218 B.C., what's that, about 300 years later, Antiochus the Great conquered Sardis again. Guess what? In the very same way. In the very same way. Question 7. In what interesting way did Jesus describe the church of Sardis? 
Well, he says, these things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You do have a name that you're alive, but you are what? Dead. Dead. And so the church of Sardis lapsed into a state of spiritual stupor and sleepiness and the absence of spiritual life that once characterized her in their earlier days. Now, do you remember how, how, remember how Sardis got conquered twice? It was while the people were what? Sleeping. Sleeping. Friends, when the members of the church fall asleep, who comes in? Yeah, Satan comes in. That's his opportunity to come in and conquer from the inside those that are vulnerable to his attack because they have fallen asleep. There's nobody sleeping out here tonight, is there? <laughs> Question eight. What advice did Jesus give to the sleeping congregation? Be what? Watchful. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. What's the message to Sardis here? Wake up. Wake up. He's shaking it away. Pay attention. Repent of your sleepy, do-nothing, lazy condition. Get up and get with it. That's what Jesus is saying to the church of Sardis. He's saying you're in worse shape than you think you are. You're ready to die. And you think you're alive. <clears throat> so here's the lesson. It's possible to be in church. It's possible to be occupying a pew or a seat in church and not really have a true spiritual connection with God. So how do you get back? If you're falling asleep spiritually, you're disconnected from Christ, you're dying spiritually, how do you regain your spiritual life? Well, the answer has something to do with remembering something. What were they supposed to remember that would wake them up? Well, it says, remember, therefore, how you have, or, yeah, how you have received and heard. So the key is remembering the message that first brought you this vibrancy, this spiritual life and excitement for God. Remember that and how you first received it. You know, I've had some dry periods in my spiritual life, and you have too. And uh, I start looking back and thinking, wait a minute. Uh, I go back to my early experience, my conversion, and, and how I received the Word of God, and how I loved to hear it, and, and how I studied it, and I meditated upon it, and and then as I remember that, then I start to be revived. And that's what's needed there is a revival by remembering what they had. If you don't watch, I'm going to come upon you like a what? A thief. And you're not going to know the hour that I come upon you. Wow. Now when the Bible talks about coming like a thief, guys, it's often talking about the end of probation. The end of what? Probation. Probation. For an individual, for a nation, or for the entire world at large. The thief, the end of probation, comes suddenly, unexpectedly, silently. Now for Sardis, their time of probation and their opportunity to repent was coming to a close. And they needed to know the urgency of the hour. That's why he's trying to wake them up, because their period of probation was... Coming to a close. It was like the days of Noah. Remember Noah building the ark? And then and then he got on the ark with his family, and it says the door was shut. And that was the close of probation for the end of the for the world in Noah's day. And guess what? The flood didn't come when Noah went out of the ark. Not till seven days later it started to rain. And you know when it started to rain, people went running for the ark. But could they get in? No, the door was shut. Probation was over. And they didn't know that until it was too late. Protestant Reformation that began with Luther there in 1517 was accompanied with tremendous spiritual life and spiritual power. But guess what? Over time, the spiritual power of the Reformation began to wane. It began to diminish. In fact, later Reformers wrote that they found many Reformation churches were in a state of apostasy almost as bad as the medieval church they had tried to reform. Pretty sad. 
And by the way, where did the Protestant Reformation really take place? What part of the world? That was in Europe, right? Western Europe? Germany? Switzerland? Those places? England? Now, if you go visit Europe today, what kind of state do you find Christianity in in Europe today? Huh? <laughs> it's almost non-existent. Yeah. It's become one of the most secular parts of the whole world, right? The churches have been turned into restaurants and bars and anything else they can think of. And hardly anybody's going to church over there. In the very place the Reformation made such an impact in Luther's time. Question 10. What word describes those who refuse to defile their garments? Well, he says, for those that haven't defiled their garments, they're going to walk with me in white, for they are what? Worthy. Now, garments, guys, represents personal character. It's what's evident on the outside that can be seen by people. See, we see our clothes, right? You see my clothes, I see your clothes. It's what they can see. Your garments, our character, it's been said, is what we wear before the world. And he says these people have worthy characters here. Uh, loss of spiritual life and connection results in a defilement of the character, and that creates a state of unworthiness to be in God's kingdom. So some in Sardis were worthy of God's kingdom because their spiritual character was still intact. They had not fallen asleep. Question 11. What do you think the garments represent? Uh, Revelation 3.18 uh, Buy from me, Jesus says, white garments that you might be clothed. The shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Alright, so the the white garments. Let's go to question 11 there in your notes. If I can find question 11 here. There we go. It says, being clothed with white raiment is explained in other scriptures to be a symbol of exchanging iniquity for righteousness. Take away the filthy garments. I've caused your iniquity to pass from you. The fine linen or white raiment is called the what? Righteousness of saints. Okay, so there's a guy that's trading his filthy garments for the beautiful white robe of Jesus. His righteousness that he gives us as a gift. Can't earn it, can't buy it, can't produce it. Receive it as a gift when we give up our garments and say, I can't wear these anymore. I need new clothes. Question 12. Whose name is going to remain in the book of life? He who what? Overcomes. Will not have his name blotted out of the book of life. He who overcomes. I'll confess his name before my father and his angels. So, overcomers... What kind of robes do they have? White robes of righteousness. Who are they provided by? Jesus gives us. And they result in characters that are worthy of a place in God's kingdom and a name written in the book of life. Pretty good deal, right? Yes, Jesus is the only one who can give us the righteousness that can pass through the judgment of God. And the only one who can give us righteousness is the one who says he will if we buy it from him without money and without price. What's the big lesson of Sardis? From Sardis we learn that reformations have to be sustained. They have to be completed. They have to be carried all the way through. Otherwise, we might lose the very reforms that we began if we're not careful. Does that make sense? Reformations must be Completed. Okay. Now, speaking of judgment and getting through the judgment of God, I'm going to move into the sixth church here, Revelation. That's called the Church of Philadelphia. That's the missionary church of the judgment hour. Now, Philadelphia was on the Roman highway. There you can see it. Between Sardis and Laodicea. It was built on a hill overlooking two valleys. There's some... Uh, Remains of Philadelphia. By the way, what does Philadelphia mean? You know, brotherly love. Brotherly love. Now that was a name that was given by King Attalus the Second of Pergamus in memory of his brother King Eumenes the Second. He named this city Brotherly Love out of respect for his brother whom he loved. <laughs> and that city remains on the same spot today, Philadelphia. My wife's from Philadelphia. 
Right? One in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one over there. <laughs> Question 13. What key is Jesus holding when he speaks to the Philadelphia church? Let's see here. He who has the key of David. The key of David. Now, how does Jesus use the key of David? Well, he uses it, it says, to open and no one shuts, and to shut and no one opens. Right? So I have keys up here. You guys probably have keys. What do we do with keys? We open and shut doors that are locked, right? And with the key of David, he opens a door that once it's opened, it can't be what? Shut. It can't be shut. So are you asking now, what door is that? What, what door does Jesus open? And once it's open, it can't be shut. Well, you know, in Isaiah 22, 22, you want to write that down in your notes. I don't know if it's in your notes, but Isaiah 22, 22 mentions the key of the house of David, which was Judah's royal throne. So the key to the house of David was Judah's royal throne. Now it's interesting that Jesus, one of his names in the Bible is Son of Son of David. Remember the guy by the road that was saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. Now Jesus is called the Son of David because he's the true heir to David's throne and all of its authority. So as we wind down to the end of history, Jesus is about to assume his kingly power and his kingly authority. He's about to open that door. And no one can prevent his coming kingdom. Question 15. What did Jesus say he had set before the Philadelphia church? I've set before you a what? Open door. And no one can shut it. You have a little strength. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Now, by the time we come to Philadelphia, you know, we're, we're following the span of centuries, the Christian church down through the centuries. Now we're up to a time about 1840s. And the 1840s in history witnessed a very powerful movement. And the powerful movement, much like the Reformation, was led by Christians who discovered something. Now, what did Martin Luther discover? He discovered the just will live by faith. Well, these people in the 1840s discovered that Jesus Christ is our high priest in heaven in a sanctuary or temple, the Bible describes up in heaven, and that uh, he had entered into an important phase of ministry as our high priest in heaven, and they began proclaiming the hour of God's judgment has come. We're going to study this important time, this important work of Christ in heaven before he comes later when we get to Revelation chapter 14. So just put pause there. I just wanted to share that with you briefly before we go on. Question 16. Even with a little strength, what two things have the Philadelphia church done? Well, he says you got a little strength, but you have kept my word and you've not denied my name. So two things the Philadelphians did, kept God's word, and did not deny Christ's name. Alright, because they followed Christ's command to persevere, what was the Philadelphia church going to be spared? Well, he says, I will, I will keep you, I will spare you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That's probably talking there about the great tribulation, the great, um, called the time of trouble in the Bible, that these people would be spared from it. Now, how are they spared from it? Well, if you go back to the 1840s, are any of those people still alive? No. So they've been spared from that, right? Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. Don't let anybody... Take your crown. He that overcomes is going to make him a pillar in the temple of my God. So there's a connection there with the temple. We're going to talk about that. I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. 
and he will go out no more. I'm going to write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, and write on him my new name. All right, so the Church of Philadelphia, Christians in that period of the 1840s, they did a great work in preparing the world for the hour of God's judgment. And as a result, they'll be spared from the time of trouble. And I guess the lesson of the Church of Philadelphia age is, when Jesus opens the door, what should you do? You go through it, right? Open the door, you need to go through it. It's very important that we don't hesitate. We need to go through the doors that he opens. All right, we're almost done. Here we go. Now we're in the seventh and final church of Revelation and the final era of Christian history that it represents. I hope you can start to see something, folks. Where are we living today? Are, are, are there any other churches that are listed? What would that tell us then? Now, Laodicea is the lukewarm end-time church of prophecy. It lasts from 1840 to what date should we put in there? <laughs> That's kind of a trick question, right? <laughs> you guys know the verse, right? Nobody knows the... And we don't know. That's why it's left blank. We don't know that. We don't want anybody running out of here saying, Husto said Jesus is coming in. <laughs> Rob said, no, that's, we're not going to say, we're not going to go date because we can't know. By the way, why doesn't the Lord tell us? Well, he knows something about us, right? As soon as he told us, we would just wait till the last minute. So he leaves us in suspense. All right, Laodicea was a cosmopolitan commercial paradise, a banking and business center, and the residents of Laodicea were rich, and they were proud of the fact that they were wealthy and prosperous. But in spite of their material wealth, they lacked any true spiritual wealth in Laodicea. I am told that Laodicea had a medical school famous for eye ointments. It was a resort town. It had hot springs, health spas. But when you got to Laodicea, you would be disappointed by one thing, and that was the quality of the drinking water. Because it came from a source far away, and by the time it arrived in Laodicea, guess what the temperature was? Lukewarm. Anybody like to drink lukewarm water? <laughs> well, that's what they had in Laodicea. Here's some ruins of ancient Laodicea there. And there's some more. How much left of that place? Question 18. How does the faithful true witness describe this Laodicean church? Oh, look at this. Write to the Laodiceans and say, this is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, and I notice that they're not cold or hot. I wish they were cold or hot. And so then because you are lukewarm and either cold or hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. It's like it takes a drink. Oh, it's cool, terrible. And so it's effect. Lukewarm, poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked. That's how Laodicea is cried. What are they? Poor, wretched, miserable, blind. Now, if somebody looked at the city of Laodicea, they would never use those words to describe Laodicea. But God's looking at something different. And he saw the inside of people's hearts. And he said, it's, it's not a pretty picture. Question 19, how did this church feel about itself? What was Laodicea saying? Ah, we're rich. We have become wealthy. We have absolutely need of nothing. And you don't know. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So... It's interesting, folks, that Laodicea's outward wealth and prosperity actually blinded it to its own internal poverty. And this blindness brings out this strong rebuke from Jesus, the true witness. Check this out. He sees actually nothing he can actually commend in that church of Laodicea. Nothing. And so, Laodicea represents the Christian church today. This is Christ's description of Christianity in the last days of verse history. 
Is he right? Are we sort of rich and increased with goods? Do we feel like we have need of nothing? That's a major cause for concern when you think about it. Question 20, what prescription does God give this church to correct its ills? Oh, thank God, there's a remedy. I counsel you to buy from me, he says, gold refined in the fire that you can be rich and and white garments that you can be clothed. And and I want you to, uh, what's the next one? I'm not getting any forward action on that. Oh, there, there we go. And, and anoint your eyes with eye salve so you can see. Oh, they had that medical school, famous for eye ointments. But they needed a different kind of eye ointment, right? It wasn't physical blindness. It was a spiritual blindness that had come upon the people. Now the good news is, folks, that Jesus has everything his church needs to remedy its miserable condition. What do you say? Yeah. Yes, everything the church needs. What are they? Gold. The gold can represent faith and fervent love. That's real gold. That's real wealth. To have faith and love. White robes, we learned it represents righteousness, the character that can pass the judgment. And ISAB represents spiritual discernment. Let's go to question 20. We're almost done. Let's look at 20 now. It says in the notes, to people who thought they were rich, he presented himself as the source of true riches. To people who thought they had a remedy for all sorts of eye troubles, he offered the only effective eye ointment. And to people who thought they made some of the finest garments in the world, he offered the white, not black robes, of his own righteousness. All right? So they were... Uh, in need of all those things, and all those things were provided for free if they would come to Jesus and buy without money and without price. What precious promise is made to the last church here? Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and does what? You've got to open the door. Open the door, he says. It's up to us. He's not going to force it open. He's not going to push his way in. He's knocking. And he's knocking for us to open. I heard somebody say once, he's knocking through our prosperity. And when we prosper, that's the Lord saying to us, I'm here, I'm blessing you, you need to recognize me. He's knocking through our prosperity. We open up to him, he comes in, and then it says, he will come in and dine with us. And we will be able to dine with him. To him who overcomes, I'm going to grant to sit with me on my throne as I sat down with my father on his throne. You as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. That's quite a transition, isn't it, when you think about it? Going from poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked, and then you're sitting with Jesus on the throne. Amen. Because you've overcome all of that great spiritual need. So here's the good news. We're sending you home tonight with good news. Friends, the Laodicean church is going to catch on fire before the end. What do you say? Amen. Oh, yeah. It's going to become spiritually rich. It's going to become clothed with the righteousness of Christ. It's going to become filled with the Holy Spirit, all in preparation for the return of Jesus, because there's no other church described coming after Laodicea in <laughs> Revelation. Let's look at our responses now. The first one says, I want Jesus to come into my heart so I can become a radiant, loving Christian who's on fire for the Lord. Is that what you want tonight? Amen. I'm checking that up here. That's what I want. Number two, I choose to be a true, vibrant Christian by spending time every day studying about Jesus and witnessing him. How many would like to make that commitment tonight? All right? Check that on your second box there, and let's have prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for all we've learned here tonight in the seven churches. We see we're living way down here in Laodicea. What an accurate picture and diagnosis you've made of your church in every era of time, from the time of John in the first century to our time today. Lord, 
You're the faithful witness. You see everything the way it really is. And we're so thankful to know tonight that you've got a remedy for every ill, a solution to every problem, and a plan to bring about a revival in these last days. We want to be part of that. So Lord, forgive us for our, our feeling that we don't need anything. And show us our poverty. Open our eyes and help us come to you for the gold, the faith and love, the white raiment, the eye salve that we need. We pray to be part of the church triumphant mm -hmm. that you're going to produce here on earth mm -hmm. before you come again a second time. May we all here tonight be part of that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, folks, thanks for coming tonight. And uh, we're back again tomorrow night. Tomorrow night we're going to get into the seven seals. Well,